If you are in AP World History, you need to know about Emily Glankler from Antisocial Studies, who is here, who's a genius. If you don't follow Antisocial Studies on TikTok and Instagram, you're missing out. I'm John from Marco Learning. I'm here to hang out. I'm gonna I'm gonna be providing color commentary and questions and links in the chat. Thank you all for joining. Emily, what is gonna be on the menu for tonight's AP World Feast? Well, tonight uh, I have been going through, I did on our first live that's now saved on the Marco Learning YouTube, I talked about how to review for history tests. So you can go back and watch that for my big picture on how to approach it. Then I talked about writing and some good writing. And today I'm going to talk about like test taking strategies. So we're going to talk a lot about the multiple choice and we're going to talk a lot about the SAQ especially. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. Uh, test taking stuff is my favorite thing in the world. So I'm going to be in the chat, everyone. Again, follow Emily on Antisocial Studies here on YouTube. I've just posted a link to her channel in the chat um, and in the description. And uh, like I said, let us know where you're coming from and, and post your questions in the chat. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Hey, Kami. Um, so yeah, let me just, let me just hop right in and we're going to bring John back in a, uh, second because John is the expert on all things college board. Um, and so he can tell us a little bit about what the test experience is actually going to look like as far as we know. But for now, I do just want to talk a little bit about my general approach to taking the test, no matter what year it is, no matter whether that's a COVID year, a digital test, a paper test. And so first, you know, I have been sharing, you know, I think we all know that there's like a paper test and a digital test. If you want to know kind of a, a deeper dive rundown of what those look like, we've talked about those in the earlier videos that are all saved on this YouTube channel. So make sure that you're subscribed. Hey, Samantha. Um, and then I've been sharing this. I mean, obviously, the one of the best resources you can use to help yourself review is Marco Learning. That's where we are right now. Um, we make study packs for you that are free. I'm going to be leading a more in-depth kind of cramming course starting in April that you can sign up for. And so go there, there's a ton of free resources for students. And then there's a lot of great like classes and test prep stuff. For example, in this one that I'm doing, uh, you also get like written feedback. You get to write some practice essays and get feedback. And then this is me. So I'm anti Emily from Antisocial Studies. And I also have my own YouTube channel and I've been posting TikToks. I am reviewing literally the entire content of the whole course through TikTok. I've almost made it through unit one. Um, I'm doing one TikTok a day. All right. So uh, the AP World testing hack, the number one, and this is just like, this is the most important one for you to understand, is that there is no such thing as a perfect score on the AP exam. And in general, you need to remove all your previous like ideas about what is doing well on a test. Because in our, especially the American education system, we've convinced ourselves that like doing well is getting an A. It's getting a 90%. And like getting a 70% is like, oh, you barely passed and whatever. That is just not the way the math works on this exam. The, the, the line that I say to my students all year is I say math does not exist in AP world. Like math doesn't exist, right? So if you're taking, like if my kids are writing a DBQ and you get a five out of seven, that's amazing, right? Because if you took five divided by seven, I don't know what that would be, but it would not be a quote unquote good score in terms of our like percentages, but a five out of seven on the DBQ is awesome. And that expands to the entire test. So I want you to take a second and think about it. You don't have to necessarily put it in the chat. I know there's like a tiny bit of a delay, so I might miss some of your guesses, but I want you to take a second and think about if you're gonna take the whole test, like you're gonna look at 55 multiple choice questions, the SAQ, the LEQ, the DBQ, the whole thing, and you're gonna kind of average how you did across all those sections, right? You might, you'll probably do better in one and a little worse than another, whatever. But you take the average, I want you to guess like what percentage average do you think you need to pass the test to get a passing score to get that credit on the AP exam of a three out of five and a lot of people will guess a really high number they'll at least guess 70 from what we can tell based on past AP world history exams and keep in mind this is different for every AP exam so if you're watching and you're for you're taking the AP US score or whatever um it's going to be a little bit different okay well 40 percent no it's going to be 60 percent so you if you average a 60 which in my school is a D it is a D minus if you ever just 60 across all of them then you're in line to be passing that AP exam with a three right and so what that means is that like think about what 60 percent of the multiple choice section is 
that's a little over half. So if you have 55 multiple choice questions, you're gonna watch Emily do some fast math. Half of that would be like 22. You're talking about like maybe getting 25 out of the 55 right. That's not right. You're talking about getting like 30 out of the 55 right. So think about if you took a test in your class and you only got 60% of the questions right and you got a 60, you would probably be a little bummed. But on the AP test, that's awesome, right? And so again, for the AP world exam specifically, from what we can tell, you're wanting to average across all the sections around a 60% for a three, around a 70% for a four, and around an 80% for a five. I want everyone to notice, you don't need an A. You don't need a 100, right? You don't need a 90%. You just have to do pretty well on all of the sections. So obviously what that means, if you're really wanting to get a five, like you have to do pretty well on each of the sections to average out, but you don't have to be getting a perfect score. And in fact, like almost no one ever gets a perfect score. I do remember two years ago, one student like literally got a perfect score, got every single point right they could. And teachers around the world were like freaking out. It was a huge deal. And so again, before we even get into test taking strategy, this is a really important part of this to understand because what it means is that this is not about like getting every single point possible. This is about getting as many points as possible. This is about being strategic in the time that you're given because in the time that you're given, you're probably not gonna write the perfect DBQ and that's totally fine, right? As long as you don't just like leave the DBQ blank, right? Okay, so with that in mind, now we've like adjusted our expectations, right? We're looking for like a D, a C or a B, right? That's what we're looking for. You know, keep in mind this AP test is going to be on everything you've learned all year. So you might be going, oh great, I get 90s on my tests in class, so I don't even have to prepare. Well, you know, keep in mind that the tests you take in class are probably on like one unit that you've just studied as opposed to taking a big test on the whole thing. But still, hopefully this will help like adjust your expectations so that if you're going and you're taking practice tests, whether that's through Marco Learning or you have a practice test book or whatever, and you're scoring yourself and you're getting around 80% of the questions right, that's amazing. You should be really excited about that. Okay, awesome. So what that means, especially in the first chunk of the test, the multiple choice and the short answer question, this is gonna hurt my brain and heart and everything to say it, but on the AP test for this first part, it's quantity over quality. And I wanna be really clear what I mean here. It's better, to get more answers right, like that are just like, okay, fine. Yeah, you get the point. As opposed to spending time making sure that like every point you get is like amazing, right? And that especially applies on the short answer question, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it also applies on the multiple choice. And so what that means is on the multiple choice you have, no matter what test you're taking, you're gonna have 55 multiple choice questions. You should just Eliminate from your brain the idea that you're gonna get 55 of those questions right, all of them. I will tell you right now, whenever the College Board puts out a practice exam, I take it, I time myself, and like there are times when I don't get all 55 questions right. And not to brag, but like, I know a lot about AP World. And there are times when I, when I don't get them all right. Um, I might get 53, maybe 54, and then I kind of brag about it as my husband. And he's like, I don't care, I don't do AP World. So the idea is it's better if you get to a question and you're like, this is going to take me 10 minutes just to figure out what the heck they're asking. It's better to just like make a semi-educated guess and move on rather than spend 10 minutes sorting through that question and then run out of time. And maybe you have five questions left at the end that you would have gotten if you had just seen them, but you didn't even give yourself a chance to see them. Now, this we're going to talk about strategy as it relates to the digital exam because if you are taking either the second or the third administration the two later dates and you're taking it digitally there is a little hiccup of like you can't go back and forth between the multiple choice and john and i are going to talk through that with y'all in just a few minutes but if you are taking the paper exam what that means is like you'll have all your multiple choice right there on the paper test you can skip right? You can skip a question. If you get to one and you're like, I don't know, this is going to be a really long time. You can just sort of mark it down and say like, okay, I need to come back to that and work your way through and grab the sort of easier points first. 
make sure that you see every question so that you get all of the easiest points, the points that you look through, you think about it, you're like, oh, I feel fairly solid about that question. Then when you're running out of time, go back to the ones you were gonna struggle with anyway, right? Um, the last thing before we look at a, an example of a multiple choice is that on the test, it's, it's pretty rare that you'll see like a slam dunk multiple choice question, meaning it's just because they're not asking like just really straightforward fact-based questions, right? So it's really rare that you're going to get a question where you're just like, boom, I know the answer and I can move on. I don't even have to think about it. So don't freak out if you're working your way through and all of them are like, uh, I feel... 75% good about that answer. That's great. That's how you're supposed to be feeling while you take this test is you should be feeling like, ah, I mean, I would like to spend more time thinking about it, but I feel pretty good about that answer. So I'm going to move on. That's the sweet spot. Um, and yes, please be posting in the chat any questions that you have, especially if it's about what the test is going to look like. And especially if it's about like multiple choice short answer question, because that's what we're here for today. Okay. So I will say, with all of that being said, right, you don't have to get all of them right. Each multiple choice question is worth the same amount of points. So like an easy one is worth the same amount of points as a hard one. So make sure you get all the easy ones first, easy-ish. But here's a little bit more strategy, which is that you should start always by eliminating answers that can't be true. Either they're historically inaccurate or they have nothing to do with the question. It could be an accurate statement, but it's like that doesn't have anything to do with what the question's asking. Eliminate wrong answers first, always, because there's very rarely like a super clear and obvious right answer. If there is, then great and move on. But for most people, that's pretty rare. And so you first want to say, okay, there's normally going to be at least one or maybe two that are pretty clearly not the answer. Like you're like, this just has nothing to do with what I'm being asked. And yes, this is going to be posted on the Marco Learning Channel. Then you get down to two, ideally, you get down to even three, like make an educated guess, whichever one you feel the best about or the least bad about, pick it and move on. Now, if you get down to like two and you're just like, I, it's a coin flip, I have no idea. Okay, that's where these last few tips apply, right? So in general, if you feel like pretty good about one answer, then just pick that answer and move on. But if you're down to two and you're like, I literally have no idea, I have no idea which one it is, then pick the answer between those two that's more directly related back to the document they gave you. The document they give you is never random, right? So you'll get a stimulus, you'll get a map or a quote or an image or whatever. And if you look at the two answer choices you're stuck between and one of them, you're like, well, this could, this is true and could apply. But the other one is like more specifically about, let's say the painting is, a, is about religion and that one's about religion, then pick that one if you're just totally stuck. <laughs> and if you are like really stuck, you're like, I don't even know which one more directly relates, then pick the statement that's more vague. That is my like last resort. You're like, I don't know, I'm down to two or three or even four and I have no clue, right? A lot of teachers used to joke, they'd be like, pick a letter and just go B, 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 B. I say, no, 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 if you are just making a random guess, always pick the statement that is the most vague, the most broad, because the more specific an answer is, the more chances for it to be wrong. I wanna be really clear, this is only if you were like desperate. So it is not a good strategy to go through and just pick all the vague answers and move on. But it means like, if you're just like, shoot, I have no idea. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of what I mean by like a vague answer in a second. So again, this is sort of the order of operations. Eliminate, if you feel pretty good about one that's left, don't question it, just, I feel pretty good about that, move on. If you're still stuck between the two, okay, which one's more directly connected to what they're asking? And if you're really lost, pick the answer that's the more vague. Um, okay, so let's look at a practice. And yes, Gina, I'm so glad you asked. We will be practicing. So this is a practice question uh, that I have used for a few years now. And so you can look at the document. It's showing you a map. Um, you, y'all, read the source. Read the source. It is amazing to me how many students, I even had, a, I even had some students recently in my own class that we were doing something like this and they were like, oh, I didn't know you could get like new information from the source information. And I was like, oh, what have I, what have I been doing all year? I feel like I failed you if I forgot to say that. And so the first thing you should do is like read what it is. The AP exam will tell you what it is. So it's called British Indian Submarine Telegraph Cable. So it's below the ocean and they're laying telegraph cable. 
and it's running from the Suez Canal in Egypt to Bombay in India. And I say this because every year, without a doubt, when I show this document, kids go like this, and they're like, I can't read what all these little things say. And I'm like, you don't need to. It tells you exact everything you need to know tells you right here. This is just now a pretty picture that goes with it. It's telling you, hey, it's telegraph cable. It's going from Egypt to India. It's for Britain. Great, that's all you need to know. Okay, now you look at the question and it says, technologies like the telegraph cable depicted in the map above had which of the following effects on empires from 1750 to 1900? And so there are some keywords there that you would want to notice. We're talking about new technology specifically, and we're talking about what impact does it have on empires? So this could be many, many things, but it could be, does it make them bigger? Does it make them smaller? Does it make it easier to have empires? Does it make empires collapse? So if you really wanted to, you could come up with an educated guess just based on what you know. Like based on what I know, I'm like, well, technology in general has been good for it. It like makes, it makes empires, it like helps them kind of connect each other. But it, you know, that connection could also lead to maybe like people across the empires kind of rebelling. So I have a little bit of an idea of what I think it might be. What I'm going to go through first, though, is I'm going to go through and see if there are any answers that could not be the right answer. And so what I'm looking for is you can you can approach this first step like a true false statement. If there's a false statement, like if it is saying if it says a thing that is not historically true, as far as you know, then that can't be the answer, <laughs> even if it would be a good answer for the question. If you're like, that didn't happen. And second, if it's a statement that's true, but you're like, this has nothing to do with technologies impacting empires. So let's see if there's any we can eliminate. Empires were able to grow much larger as messages and information could travel at very rapid speeds. That makes sense. Messages travel fast on telegraph. So I'm going to keep that. Empires were slow to take up advanced communications technologies until the end of the 19th century and didn't realize much benefit from them. Well, no, I know that's not true. I know like railroads, right? I mean, they like the United States is like building the heck out of railroads. They're all understanding like how important it is to be able to communicate, right? So that doesn't really seem to be a thing that would happen. Empires only used technology like telegraph cables for military purposes as they were too expensive for daily public use. I do not know if that's true or not. So I'm gonna put a question mark. I'm like, I actually have no idea. That sounds like a re an okay statement for me, but I don't know if that's true. So I'm gonna leave it. I just don't know. Empires found expansion more difficult as communications technologies like the telegraph diffused quick, quickly all over the world. Eh, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. If technology is diffusing quickly, that would make them expanding easier, right? If a, um, it just, it, it connects places together. So now I'm down to these two and I want to go back and decide, okay, which one more closely answers this question? So I'm going to look back at it. Okay, technologies like the telegraph had what impact on empires? Well, this one says empires were able to grow larger as messages and information could travel at rapid speeds. And like, that's kind of like what I predicted. Like, yeah, that makes logical sense to me. This one here about telegraph for military, uh, I mean, maybe, but I'm not totally sure <laughs> if that's true. And when in doubt, when I was saying before, pick the one that's more vague, I want you to notice A is more vague. So again, I would also just pick A because in my gut I'd go, that just see yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking the answer might be. But let's say you honestly didn't know between any of these. I want you to notice there are a lot of words in these different places that make things a little bit more specific, right? So empires were able to grow larger as information traveled at rapid speeds. That's a super general statement, but like, yeah, it's true, it's true. As opposed to C, or if they say they're only using it for military purposes, that's now a very specific thing. It was too expensive for daily public use. That's a lot of specific statements where if one of those statements is wrong, then it's wrong, right? And so if all of a sudden it's like, well, this whole thing is true, except they only used it for economic purposes. Well, now this whole thing is wrong. So again, you know, I think most of us looking at this could just look and say, okay, my best answer or my least worst answer is gonna be A. But even when in doubt, it's also it also just kind of follows that rule of like, you know what, it's the most vaguely true, right? So, okay, makes sense, hopefully. Now let's look at one more question with this stimulus, which says, based on the map and your knowledge of world history, which of the following likely accounts for the westernmost end of the cable in Egypt? Okay, here's another aspect of 
these questions. This tells you, based on your map and your knowledge of world history, what it's telling you is like, you're gonna have to bring in some outside information that you know to answer this question. Meaning like the answers, if you being able to go in and read these little, all these little entries is not gonna be helpful to you, right? So it's saying, okay, the westernmost end of the cable in Egypt, it tells us it runs from the Suez Canal in Egypt. And it's asking you, why is it there? Why is this telegraph starting in the Suez Canal in Egypt? And so you might go like, what do you know about the Suez Canal? By the way, I picked this question before a ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. So it's eerie that uh, the news is like stalking me. Okay, so again, you first step can go through and just eliminate something that's a wrong statement. So let's see if any of these statements are just historically inaccurate. So the French garrison in Egypt needed to communicate with the Indian colonies. Uh, I mean, I, I, the French had something to do with the Suez Canal, but I don't think they had Indian colonies at this point. I'm still not gonna eliminate it totally, but I'm like, I don't think so. The Suez Canal was a strategic outpost for European influence in the region. Yes, that's a true statement. The Ottoman Empire demanded that the cable from India be built through Egypt. Okay, well, I do know that in the 1800s, Egypt was still at some point technically part of the Ottoman Empire. So like, I'll keep that around. Italian investors instructed that the cable go through their colonies in Egypt. No, Italy was struggling. Italy like didn't really have a lot of colonies at this point. Um, they're gonna end up with a few down here, but like they would not have had enough power to demand that the British build it where they want it. Right, because this is this is the thing to consider. So now we're back here. I definitely don't think it has anything to do with Italy, because like, why would it? This French thing, I'm like, ah, I don't know, but it's specifically showing us a British Indian submarine cable. So again, which one relates more closely to the document? This to me seems wrong. And so now I'm down to B and C, because B and C are both logically true. The Suez Canal was a strategic outpost for Europeans. But also the Ottoman Empire still did hold some power, right? I mean, they're still around. They still for a while were, were in control of Egypt until Muhammad Ali kind of asserts their independence. So again, if I'm stuck, first, which one more directly relates to the document they gave us, right? The document they gave us is a British document and Britain's in Europe, not the Ottoman Empire. So I'd pick B. If I still wasn't sure, I'd say, which of these statements is more general? Well, this one is literally like written in the passive voice. It's saying the Suez Canal was a strategic outpost for European influence. It doesn't say they directly controlled it. It doesn't even say which European country. It doesn't even say what kind, it just says it's strategic. That's a pretty vague statement. And so I'm like, yeah, well, that is true, right? Whereas this, again, the Ottoman Empire demanded is a specific word that the cable from India be built through Egypt. I mean, one, the Ottomans have nothing to do with India at this point. And two, it's like, why would they give us a British document? And there's just a lot of things in here that could be wrong. The Ottomans are kind of the sick man of Europe at this point. I'd be surprised if they were making a lot of demands. So again, I would pick B. And now that was, those are the two examples I wanted to go through before we talk a little bit more about what the test will actually look like. But you might have seen those two questions and felt pretty good about them. Like, oh, I could have answered those or maybe not. But either way, I want you to just notice the strategy, right? You don't necessarily have to do this whole thing every time, right? If you look, if you skim through the answers and you immediately see the one that you're like, oh my gut, like 70% of me is telling that one, then pick it and move on. I'm showing you every step you might take if you are just like, well, okay, I still don't know what it is. I still don't know what it is. So again, don't force yourself to work through these steps every time if you don't need to, because again, it's quantity over quality, right? So if you can save yourself from some time by like picking a few where you're like, yeah, I feel pretty good about B, just pick B and move on. And that'll save you some time so that on another question where you do maybe have to work your way all the way down, you still have time to get through all of them. Um, and I'm proud of y'all too, that you're getting them right. That's awesome, cool. If, hopefully this is something that maybe you are learning about right now or you just learned about. I know in my class, we literally talked about the Suez Canal today. So uh, that's pretty cool. Okay, John, if you wanna come on back, I would love to talk about the digital exam a little bit. Yeah, that's a great, um, first of all, I'm learning so much from you. I think this is so cool. These um, Your Suez Canal obsession is complete. I've seen your TikTok on it. Um, one thing I want to share with all of you, I have a question for everyone in the chat. Do you know whether you're taking the paper and pencil exam 
or the digital exam. We know we've got the paper and pencil exam as the first one, and then there's gonna be two digital exams in late May and early June. Because if so, if you're taking a digital exam, I wanna show you this. And Emily, uh, I know you've seen this. This is on the College Board's website. This is, hey, look at how happy he is taking an AP. I'm so excited. I mean, it's my, AP, it's my AP test day. Let me get my Superman shirt on and get all excited. Um, so a couple of things. Remember, everyone, you're going to be able to download this as of April the 8th, the actual digital testing app. I know, Emily, you'll probably go, well, I'll go live on our channels. We'll be so excited. It'll be a new, the newsiest thing ever. Let's get right to this. Um, first, actually, sorry, I'm, I'm distracted. Look at the test security statement you have to type. I will not give or receive help during this exam. I will not share or post references to this exam during testing with the window. If anyone helps me out, we will both be investigated. <laughs> you have to type this scary statement out. Um, and then you will enter into a lockdown mode. This is not the lockdown browser we all know and love. This is a lockdown mode where you can't have anything open on your computer. Um, the exam is going to start automatically if you're taking digital. And let me just check in the chat here. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of people are paper and pencil. But it looks like, like half and half. Yeah, we got a half and half. It's like team digital versus team paper and pencil um, in, in the chat here. And so this is something interesting you and I have been talking about, which is here's a sample AP US history page. And I am on the College Board's website, everyone. I'm going to post this in the chat um here and <clears throat> you can see what it says here look at this paragraph please note you are responsible for pacing yourself the clock will turn red so you got to manage your own dbq plus two saq sections so remember how it works it's multiple choice great tips you're giving on multiple choice emily i think it's really helpful look for wrong answers read the, the fine print not the fine fine print but the, but the print that matters um, but then you're going to do that with multiple choice and short answer, and then there's going to be a break. The digital exam will begin automatically, and instead of doing a DBQ plus an LEQ, a long essay question, you're going to do that DBQ, the document-based question, and two short answer questions we haven't seen before. But here's what's confusing. It says, don't spend too much time on one question. You cannot go back to the question once you've submitted it. So once you press that submit button, it sounds like, that's it. You're never going to see them again, um, which is scary. Um, yeah. So what that means is like, I assume they're going to, and again, all of this we'll know for sure on April 8th, and we'll make sure to clarify, but it sounds like, you know, the, the DBQ will maybe pop up first. You can spend as much or as little time on that DBQ within the hour and 40 minute window, right? You're supposed to spend around an hour, but then once you say, I'm done with the DBQ, I'm going to move on, then you're done with the DBQ and you're moving on, right? Yeah. And you know, one thing, you know this, Emily, that students like to maybe steal a little bit of time from a DBQ uh, for that from the LEQ for their DBQ, right? The, the LEQ is this race to write as much as you can in 40 minutes. And people will sometimes steal five, 10 minutes for the DBQ, which takes more work. You could kind of do that here. I'm not recommending that yet. I haven't thought through it enough as a strategy, but my gut tells me if I were taking this exam, I would take the 15 minutes for the DBQ. I would take the 45 minutes for the DBQ. I would steal seven minutes from the short answer questions yeah. and, and run there. So um, that's going to be very interesting. And yeah, the, a couple of people are pointing out this not going back and forth. So yeah. look at what they make you do. Actually, I'll come back to these slides. This is what's going to happen when you click a multiple choice question. So here's your stimulus on the left. Here's our map of the Middle East in the 1500s. And then on the right, is our question. We click C and then it looks like this is going to happen. Like scary menu, boo, right? You can't go back and you have to, it looks like you might have to click this every time. And so this is a very frustrating part of the digital exam. Emily, I've got a question for you. Yeah. If, if you had to pick, you have five seconds. Ooh. You're going to pick whether you're taking the exam paper and pencil or whether you're taking it digital, what do you pick? I would pick paper and pencil, but for my students, I picked digital. So oh, interesting. Why is I, that? I really think that there's pros and cons to both. So if you feel like, oh man, we have the worst one, like everyone feels that way, <laughs> no matter what they've picked. Because I think in the chat, like people are, are right. Like Imelda is saying, paper is better for the multiple choice. The fact that you can see all of them right there and you can move around is great. Like that's how I take the test. But then I do think there's something nice in the digital about being able to type everything. 
I also think that having two short answer questions instead of one long LEQ is really nice. So I do think it balances itself out and it's just a matter over the next, you know, month or month and a half or so that you prepare for the test you're taking, right? Because I think it's just gonna be a matter of like, there are gonna be kids who haven't even thought about it and then they're gonna get on the test and see that button and freak out, so. Absolutely, I think it's I think it's a very sensible view. It's like there's pros and cons, let's be honest. And the pro of the, of the paper and pencil multiple choice, this is one thing to think about everyone. I've been teaching people how to take digital tests since 2004. And that was like primitive technology. It was like a typewriter, you plugged it into the wall or something. And anyway, you the digital tests, it's almost like a different choreography, a different experience. When you're taking paper and pencil, think about it, you've got the booklet in front of you, you have a pencil in your hand, it's underneath you and you control it. When it's up on the screen, you can't really interact with it very much. It feels more intimidating. So some people are super nervous in, in the, in the, about the test. Don't be. As you practice, and as of April 8th, you're going to be able to practice. It's one of those things where you get that choreography. If you're up against a screen, maybe you're writing on some scratch paper, you'll get that under control. But I think choreographically, paper and pencil is better. Especially after, I mean, a lot of us I know have been learning on a computer all year. So it's not as weird as it was even last year when all of this was really new to us. I will say for, you know, for everyone who's asking, like, I've been getting a lot of great questions on my social media stuff about how do I get better at the multiple choice? How do I get better at this thing? I mean, like what you're saying, John, it's just it's just practice it as much as possible. Like the, this test is really unique. Like the way they ask multiple choice questions is really unique. And so... The best thing you can do besides like, you know, learning the content, paying attention to your class is just look at as many multiple choice questions as you can look at as many SAQ questions as you can. And you can do that by using the AP classroom. I know Marco learning has sample stuff. I have some sample stuff on my website. You can buy one of the test prep books. You could do all of those things because yeah, it's just a matter of if you've never seen these questions before, they seem a little funky. But really, once you look at a few LEQ prompts over and over, you start to notice some trends and you're like, they all kind of end up asking a similar thing, right? And I think in the, that's absolutely right. And I think in the context of what you said at the beginning, like your goal is not to get 100% correct. If it were, you should all be freaking out. Um, this is a scare, because Emily and I can barely get 100, but like we're, you know, high 80s, low 90s, and I'm feeling great. And that's well into the five range because we're amazing, aren't we? But we don't know all the details. We don't always get questions right. I think one other key thing is to do all this work we're talking about. Set a lower bar, practice, and do it under timed conditions. Because yeah. under timed conditions, you really try that on. And people fall on their faces in practice. Like it's the whole, and I, I know this, I worked for many years at the Princeton Review. Uh, I founded Marco Learning to make resources for AP students. The whole secret of the test prep industry is forcing people to take full length practice tests under time conditions. Because mm -hmm. once you've done that enough times in the SAT or the AP exams, you get it, you get, you solve problems in practice. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, that's absolutely critical. I think that's true too. And I think, you know, what the last thing that I'm going to kind of talk to you about in a second is why I actually think that the time crunch works in your favor. If you've prepared for the test, I actually think it works in your favor because it forces you to just go with your gut and move on. Because I know my students who are the strongest, who are, who really know the content, who really care, have really put in the work, their biggest problem is second guessing themselves. I can watch them when we're taking a test on our grading grade book app or whatever, and I can see them and be like, hit submit, you have 100, hit submit. And I can see them going back and changing answers. So honestly, and those of you that are here, you're clearly worried about it and gonna put in the work. Like, I honestly think having that time constraint will help assuming you've practiced with it and you don't like panic, right? Yeah, I love that they're all stressed in the chat, but we just had a, I, you just gave me a stress attack thinking about my students throwing away their their excellent performance because they're just, their brain, they're too smart. You, you all, we love you all. You're all too smart. Stop overthinking things. Get that 82% that you can. Now, real quick, Emily, I just wanted to show a couple of other things about this exam that we know. Um, one thing, and I had shown this on our, the Marco Learning TikTok, this is, I'm not touching anything right now. This is an animation on the College Board's page. Um, and I'm going to put the link here for you. You see that you can annotate on the DBQ. So on the document-based question, once you are able to practice as of April 8th with the digital software, this is a really cool option. Those of us who are taking paper and pencil know that we can just scribble all over the page whenever we feel like it. 
You can't scribble all over your computer, but you can use this, add and subtract annotations. So I'll leave that in the chat for everyone. Emily, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'm gonna hop back into the chat and answer Perfect. questions. And all right. So for our, the last thing that we're gonna talk about is, you know, we talked about the multiple choice a little bit. Again, that the strategy is still the same on the multiple choice, as I talked about before. It's just that if you're taking the digital, then obviously you can't do that skipping back and forth but you still can use that same strategy and you can know that like, honestly, if you're looking at a multiple choice on the digital test and it's taken you two or three minutes and you still don't know, well then walk through the strategies I just gave you and pick whatever ends up and move on with your life, right? I mean, honestly, you know, people that are worried about not being able to go back, honestly, you don't end up with a ton of spare time on the multiple choice section anyway, right? So the only thing you're missing out on is being able to like, skip a bunch of questions and come back and do those later. But I've found that honestly, like you're, everyone is really just kind of like answering each question as they go. And so um, I, I actually think it's pretty rare once kids get into the test for them to have a lot of time to go back and look at other questions. And so again, you just have to watch your time um, and you have to really pay attention to like, okay, if I'm spending more than maybe two or three minutes on one question, I need to just work it through, pick the vaguest answer, whatever's left and move on because you don't want to spend so much time that you run out on maybe some questions at the end that are easy. Because keep in mind, it's not like the test starts with the easiest questions and works its way to the hardest. I know some standardized tests used to do that. It doesn't work that way. And so there might be five questions at the very end that you would have gotten right. But if you run out of time, those are five easy points you could have grabbed. I want to picture like, I don't play video games anymore, but it's like in Mario, right? Where you're like hopping around to get like the gold coins. Like you're not going to get all of them. You're just trying to grab as many as possible and you don't want to leave any out there that you didn't even like see. So, um, and yeah, I'll post these slides. I'll post them on um, my website, antisocialstudies.org. So you can look at them later too. So the other one that I want to talk about really quickly in terms of quantity over quality, it hurts my heart to say that, is that on the SAQ, I have found that besides the multiple choice, the SAQ is the other time crunch where students, it's one of those that it seems like it should be the easiest section because you're like, these are short answers, whatever. But the part that trips students up the most is that they spend too much time early on in the short answer question section and then they run out of time by the end. And so again, timing, keeping yourself on track, which you're gonna have to do on the paper exam or the digital exam, right? You're gonna get, for example, in that one section, a set of three big SAQs and like, I think 40 minutes, and you're gonna have to keep track of that time, right? And so the point is that in an SAQ, right, you get like one big SAQ that has three little mini parts, A, B, C, and that happens three times. So ultimately, there's kind of nine little mini questions that you're answering, and each of those are worth the same amount of points. So what that means is like a very simple, straightforward, like identify an example of this thing. That's worth one point. Same as another answer that might take three or four sentences that's like identify and describe and explain the blah, blah, blah. Both of those are worth the same amount. So here's what I think we know for the digital test. The paper test, you can kind of jump around however you need to. What I think we understand on the digital test is that you will get like one SAQ with ABC. And within that, you should be able to just like have a text box where you can say like, A, I'm answering A now, you type it, right? Because on the paper test, they also, they give you a page with a box and you can write them in kind of whatever order you want within that question. And so if that's the case, then within each SAQ, answer the one you feel the best about first and work your way down to the one you feel the worst about. Right? Because again, getting two right and then what that last one that was going to be hard anyway wrong is better than spending tons of time making one really beautiful and then like having to skip the last two. So again, when I say quantity over quality, everything you write has to be correct and accurate. But my biggest tip on the SAQ is to pick and write your first correct answer, not your best correct answer. Because I have students... I'll actually, let me just show you the example. This was one of the SAQs from like two years ago. And it's this whole long document about, it's a US political scientist basically, essentially saying totalitarian states commit mass violence and democracies don't. That's cute. But, um, and so that's the gist of what he's saying. And I want you to look at A. A literally just says, identify one example of mass violence that was committed by a totalitarian state in the 20th century that would support this argument. 
You don't have to explain it. You don't have to describe it or compare it with anything else. You could literally write, and in fact, the most common answer was, one example of mass violence was the Holocaust committed by Nazi Germany. Period. Move on. One sentence. If it says identify and nothing else, you just have to identify the thing. And as long as it like clearly supports the question they're asking you, you move on. That is one point. The same as this like analysis in C that's like, explain one development in the late 20th century that shaped this guy, Rudolf Rummel, whoever the heck that is, this guy's view of the relationship between democracy and mass violence. That's a really complicated question. I mean, spoiler alert, the answer is like, he's an American, that we just won the Cold War. So he's like, democracy is better, we triumph, right? But that's a really complicated question. So saying one example is, you know, whatever, the Holocaust committed by Nazi Germany, that gets you a point the same as this like three or four sentence analysis of Rummel's point of view. Like, that's the same. Now, Kami, really good question. Most teachers, myself included, use something like ACE, right? Where they'll say you answer, oh God, you cite specific evidence and then you explain. You need to do that for every short answer question unless it just says identify. If it just says identify, you just have to identify. So you basically do the answer and the cite and you don't do the explain. Now, your teacher might require you to do all of it and you should do that because that's better writing. I'm talking about your strategy just for the AP exam, right? So I, as a teacher, ask my students to do more than they're actually gonna have to do on the AP exam. But yeah, so if it says just to identify, then you basically just give your answer and your evidence. So your answer is like one example of mass violence committed by a totalitarian state in the 20th century is, and then you could say like Stalin's purges in the 1930s. You've answered and kind of cited, but you haven't done any explaining of like why he did that, what the totalitarian state had to do with it, blah, 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 right? All these other ones, B and C, if they say anything other than just identify, if they say identify and explain or describe or explain anything else, you want to do this whole thing, right? So if we're looking at B, this says explain one historical example of a democratic state committing mass violence that would challenge Rummel's argument regarding democracies and mass violence. Okay, one thing I want you to notice here is that there is no time frame in this question. So in A, it said in the 20th century. This is why if you can annotate, I would annotate. If they give you a time frame, pay attention to that because if they don't, guess what? You can talk about any time period as long as you're talking about a democracy committing mass violence. Hello, transatlantic slave trade and like Jim Crow South in the United States. Hello, uh, Native American reservation system in the US. You could technically talk about South Africa and apartheid. South Africa is technically a democracy and they're excluding a lot of people. You can talk about the Rwandan genocide and the Rwandan government. I mean, those are in the 20th century, but the point is if, if they don't give you a time frame, as long as it happened on this planet, you can talk about it. I actually gave this as part of a test recently and one of my students made a whole argument about like COVID and like democratic states around the world. Not and, like, I was like, yeah, okay. They had enough evidence and they explained it and connected it back. I was like, I'll allow it, right? Um, so yes, this is where in terms of like saving time on the SAQ, really pay attention to what they're asking you and just very specifically answer that question, right? You don't need an intro. You don't need a hook. You don't need two pieces of evidence. It is far better to like have one specific piece of evidence and really clearly explain it. Because once you've gotten the point, you can't lose the point. Once you've gotten it, you're like, great. They give you the point and they move on. And so if you spend time, for example, on B, if you were gonna write a paragraph and you were gonna say, the United States um, was a democracy that continued the practice of slavery and it put indigenous people on reservations and it interned Japanese American citizens during World War II, well, Okay, you've answered and cited three things, but you haven't explained anything yet. So you don't get the point. It's all or nothing. So it's far better to pick one of those examples and spend another sentence or two really clearly explaining it, right? Okay. Um, I mean, Kami, for this question, in theory, you could do any time in history, but the trick is it has to be a democracy. So you'd have to go back to like Athens. You'd have to think about some mass violence Ath Athenians committed. You can talk about them using slaves or whatever. Now, this is from before the modern exam. So, like, I think for the most part, they might give you, like, since 1200. 
But the point is on these short answer questions, a lot of times we make the assumption that it's gonna be like the same question three different times and it's not. Each question is unique. And so you wanna make sure you're paying attention to what they're asking you because a lot of students predict, like they think they know where it's going. They're like, oh, I, I bet C is gonna ask me about blah, blah, blah. And in fact, if you don't read it carefully, you might miss it and just answer the wrong question. Okay, the last thing that I wanted to say, and I'm just gonna do these two in the next two minutes, because really like I have much longer videos on like the DBQ and there's a lot more resources out there. For the LEQ, if you're taking the paper test, remember that you're gonna get three prompts. Pick the prompt that you have the most evidence for, not the prompt you like the best. It's amazing to me how many students will be like, well, that prompt sounds really interesting or that prompt's on a time period I really like. And then they're like, they get into writing it and then they're like, oh wait, I don't actually know anything. I don't know any specific evidence. So take maybe three minutes when you look at the prompts and at least consider two of them out of the three and kind of think through in your brain, okay, how much specific evidence do I know about this and pick whichever one you know more about. Even if you don't like, even if the argument you'd be making, you're like, I don't actually really like this argument as much, or I don't believe this argument as much, but I can support it better with evidence than pick that one, right? And then the last strategy for the DBQ, and I'm gonna show you my resource where literally on my YouTube channel, I have broken down every part of the rubric for you in a lot more detail. But just be aware that when you're writing the DBQ, you do not need to do a full recap of every document before you jump into using it as evidence. You can work under the assumption that the person like me grading your DBQ has seen the documents. Now that doesn't mean you don't have to say anything about the document, but to save yourself some time when you're writing those DBQs, you do not need to do that whole summary of like, Document A is a painting. In the painting on the left, we see Ethiopian soldiers. On the right, they're fighting against Italian soldiers. Uh, beneath them, we see, like, you don't need to do any of that. You just need to use specifics from the document to support your argument. And you need to include enough specific information, enough kind of descriptions or whatever, or, or summaries of what they're saying, just enough to prove to me, the reader, that you know what you're talking about, right? If you just say, document A shows there was war, and then you move on, I'm like, no but you don't have to like go through and have a sentence or two just like describing the document before you just jump into using it. And if you want more information on the DBQ, I mean, one, we will be doing that a lot here at Marco Learning and at my channel too. But for last year, the entire AP exam was the DBQ, y'all. So like there is so much information out there about the DBQ. This is just on my channel. I have a whole playlist for last year's test where I literally did a video on every single part of the rubric. Right, and now some of these, like the little minutia about how it applies on the test are slightly different from last year, but like what you need to do to get a thesis statement or how you use the documents or how you hip them or evaluate them, that's all the same. So this is a resource that you should go to, especially if you're wanting to get better at the DBQ. Later on in this playlist, I even just, I wrote a DBQ live on the Marco Learning channel and on my channel, so you can just watch me struggle through it. Um, so what you should do now is you should follow us. Like follow us for the next two months and then you can unfollow us. We won't be offended, right? On YouTube, you're gonna find a lot of live reviews like this and a lot of like how-to videos. On Instagram is where you're gonna find a lot of in like quick information. Like if the College Board announces something, we will both be posting it on Instagram. And on TikTok, on my TikTok on antisocial studies, literally a video a day covering like unit one through unit nine. Um, and plus more test information, that sort of thing. And on the Marco Learning TikTok is where they really break down what the College Board is telling us. And so I would just follow these. Um, you also probably have other teachers that are out there that you really love, follow them too. Um, and in the, in the meantime, you can message us. Like we are both, John and myself are like here for you. And so you can DM me. Um, it might take me a little bit to see it, but like let me know how we can help. Um, I am going to go back through. Um, Hajar, I think that's a really good question on the SAQ. What I have seen typically is that A is like identify a thing and then the rest are more complicated. So what I've noticed is it tends to be like one out of the three. The first one's like just identify a thing a lot of times and then the other two are gonna be describe, explain, whatever, right? You're never gonna get like all identifies, that'd be too easy. Um, and Karina, I mean, analyze the documents correctly 
it kind of depends on what you mean. If you mean like analyze the point of view, that's a separate point. But like to get the basic point of using the document, you just need to take specifics from the document and apply them to the argument you're making for me to check and go, yep, you use document three or whatever well, right? But again, go check out those videos where I go into a lot more detail and I also um, give you specific examples. Okay, that's all I have, John. Great, amazing. Emily, you're amazing. I like that so much. Thank you. What a great group of students we had here. Like round of applause to all of you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this session, press that like button, definitely subscribe to our channel and then look at the description of this video. I put a lot of those links right in there and I'm going to update them. So it's great seeing you all. It's great seeing you, Emily. Uh, good luck to everyone studying for this exam where if you're, if you're here tonight live on March 29th, First of all, you're a nerd like us. We love you. Secondly, good job you. You're starting very early, and this is this is the time to really start making a plan. So be in touch with us. Let us know.